I, I think the simplest way to describe day-to-day -day life is just being terrified of everything in the world. Like every person that you see is an enemy, no matter what their complexion is. Because if, if they're white and they're not in your crew, they are a traitor. They're a traitor to your people. They're, they're complicit in the destruction of the white race. And actually it's the highest order of enemy because we would say. Arno, it is a pleasure having you on the podcast. Uh, thank you so much for making the time. You and I actually met in person once, I believe three, maybe four years ago. It's kind of hard to, to gauge time now with the pandemic because that's it like is. two years in between whatever was happening before then. I know you were right. on the road for like eight months out of the year. I was on the road permanently when I met you. I was actually living out of a backpack. So wow. now I've been posted up in Mexico City for almost a year. Oh, and, uh, nice. and you've been, and you've been, I'm assuming you haven't been on the road very much over these last uh, 18 months, right? Yeah, well, it, it's great to see you again, brother. It has been a long time. And yeah, the, the pandemic uh, put a, a halt to my beloved travel. And uh, that, that was the hardest part of it for me. And, and uh, I'm really like downright giddy to start traveling again. I'm just uh, closing uh, some engagements in Europe uh, that I've been developing and I'll be, uh, in Europe, uh, all of next May and the first two weeks of June. And I'm just like planning the trip and looking at places to stay and booking flights. And, and I'm just delighted to, to get on the road again. And I've done a little bit of traveling in the States since, uh, New York city three times already. Uh, this came from new Orleans, uh, where a doc I was involved with was screen screening and, uh, that, that's been about the extent of my travel since uh, since post pandemic began. Beautiful. Well, I want to talk about your story. Um, I understand right now you are a practicing Buddhist, and we're going to get to that later. But awesome. I do want to kick things off with a. I don't normally ask esoteric questions in the beginning of these interviews, but I'm curious. Um, if you believe in destiny, hmm. and if so, how would you kind of define destiny? That's a, I, congratulations, first of all, that's the question I've never been asked, which is, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a feat in itself. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm just too much of a being in motion to really like put a, a a lot of energy into the idea of destiny. Uh, so I, 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 I would say the simple answer is no. I, I, I think um, in a universe where everything is in constant motion, that uh, to say that something is kind of for faded, or it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. At the same time, I've gone through so many things in my life and I've been so blessed that uh, I, you know, that phrase, the planets have aligned is it comes into play in, in many descriptions. And, and so in that sense, I, I think uh, I, I'm right where I should be right now. And, and I feel good about where I'm going. So I, I don't know if, if, how that bears on, on the answer. Um, I, I think maybe I, I would say I, I also am really mindful that that my every thought and action is gonna uh, change the direction that I'm going and change the way I interact with with the rest of the universe and and so I'm very uh, thoughtful ab about the I, I try to be <laughs> I try to right. be thoughtful about my my thoughts and actions and, and where they're gonna take me. So when it comes to the 700 club, were you breaking and entering and being violent and drinking alcohol before you started being associated with that? And then that became the 700 club or did you, was it the opposite? No, I, I was, so I, I, another big milestone in my teenage years is when I started drinking myself at age 14. Mm-hmm. And, and up until 14, like I'm already violent, I'm already wild, I'm already antisocial. 
like there's this little fire that's always been smoldering and it's kind of going and, and alcohol was just a big giant can of gasoline on that fire. So it, it just took everything to another level. And I, I was originally like super into the punk scene. And to me, punk was about like breaking shit and pissing people off and, and just lashing out. And, and that, and punk's different things to different people. Uh, there's a lot of punks even back then. There, there was like kind of a subgenre of punks that we called the peace punks. Hmm. And they were like really activist oriented. They, they would be like, uh, at, at the time, there was some kind of accusation against Coors Brewery that they, they had unfair hiring practices. And so the peace punks would all be like at punk shows, handing out flyers going, boycott Coors, don't drink Coors, they're racist. And like, I didn't care one way or another who Coors did or didn't hire, but I hated the peace punks. Because to me, punk is about breaking stuff and not caring and not all this activism nonsense. So I would like drink Coors beer just to piss them off. I, I actually, I had a Coors hat that was like kind of, hey, what's up, one of Coors, dude? Like just just that kind of contrarianism was like who I was but pre 700 club days and, and it was also then that I started like disappearing for a minute or two and then like I, I'd disappear on a Saturday night and then I'd not come back till the next day and my parents would be like where the hell were you we didn't know if you were alive or dead oh my god and I'm like whatever I just went down to Racine I was hanging out with my punk homies and I I, I hung out with like punk rockers who were late teens early 20s sometimes up to their 30s and like they would be squatting in the basement of some biker's house and I'd go stay there for the night or whatever and and as I I started getting farther and farther to home that's when I'm we're breaking into places we're stealing alcohol we're stealing cigarettes we're getting in fights on the street like that that I was already like very immersed in all that stuff before the 700 club came around so what was the significance of the 700 club well, in your it, story yeah so the the reason I won't say the full address because it, people actually still live there and I, I don't <laughs> respect their their privacy, but um, 700 was the address of the house. Hmm. And uh, I originally, um, my impetus for moving in there was in the summer between, uh, sorry, the summer after sophomore year of high school. My parents and my younger brother all went out to Washington State to visit my maternal grandfather. And they asked me if I wanted to go. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not going. And, and I said, actually, I, I'm going on tour with, with this punk band. I, I or, organized a tour for them. And, and I, I did organize this like half ass punk tour for my buddy's bands, which was called NOD. Um, originally meant nuclear overdose, but we'd also like laugh and say it meant not on drugs when we all did tons of drugs and drank <laughs> profusely. Um, and so I told my parents I wasn't going to be around myself and that's why I'm not going to Washington with them. So they all went off to Washington. I, I, the tour I had organized, like our Chicago gig fell through. We were supposed to have a gig in Indianapolis. I was dating a girl who lived in Indianapolis. It, she was a, a Latina. She lived with, by her, her, with her single parent, her single mom. And somehow this like van load of 13 scummy punk rockers ends up at this poor woman's house. And she didn't speak English. She'd just be like yelling at us every day to leave in Spanish. <laughs> and my girlfriend be like, no, no, it's fine. <laughs> you guys can stay here. Don't worry about it. We got all the shows we had fell through. And we ended up getting stranded in Indianapolis. Uh, we actually made a version of Hotel California, but instead of that, it was uh, the state of Indiana. So, Welcome to the state of Indiana. You can check out anytime you like, but you can never leave. And we, we ended up uh, waiting until some guy's dad wired us uh, gas money to get home. And as we're headed home, I'm like, dude, let's all go to my house. Like my parents are gone. So this entire entourage ended up at my parents' nice house and we just absolutely tore it down. I, I mm -hmm. just, 
everything that could be broken was broken. Every it was I um I still feel bad about doing it. My my younger brother is still angry at me about it. My my dad and mom have like finally got over it a little bit. But basically the way it shook down was I had lost track of time and when my parents were coming back. And there was one morning where my mom's friend wakes me up and I'm kind of scrambling in this pile of beer cans and I got some naked girl next to me and she's like, Arnie, what have you done to this house? You better start cleaning because your parents are getting home tomorrow. And I kind of like, her name was Cindy and I, I convinced Cindy that I was going to clean um, enough for her to leave. And then as soon as she left, I'm like, we got to get the hell out of here. And we all just like disappeared. And I, and I, I was gone for a month after that. My, my parents, it took them that long to find me. And I, I never, it, it didn't hit me like what I put them through until I was a parent and I was at uh, Six Flags with my 12 year old daughter and she was being a 12 year old and she just kind of disappeared for like an hour and I lost my mind, like thinking of every horrible thing that could happen to her. And I finally find her an hour later sitting there like me. And I was just like, oh, and I, I was not even mad at her. I was like, oh, I'm so glad you're here and you're okay. And, and then I, I after that, and the, the, after the emotional dust settled, I was kind of like, that sucked, didn't it? Yeah, you put your mom through that for a month a, a month imagine that hour of hell you just experienced and extend it to a month and that's what you put your mom through and you and my dad and uh it, my mom finally tracked me down in racine this like a little rust belt town between milwaukee and chicago where a lot of the punk rockers i knew were and uh she came pick me up and again she wasn't didn't yell at me she just hugged me and was glad i was still alive and on the way back i was like i'm not going back to school uh, I got a bunch of friends in Milwaukee who are getting a house and I'm going to move in with them. And that's the way it is. And by this time they had just, they had completely lost control of me. And my mom's just like, okay, well, I'll buy you groceries or whatever. Like she, she was, uh, offering to like, just help me do, help me get by and, and whatever poor decision I was making. So that, that, that house was what became the 700 club. And when I initially moved in there, it was me and like four or five of my punk rock buddies. And then as I started getting in the whole skinhead thing and I'd get my skinhead buddies to come by more often, like we literally drove all the punk rockers out of the house and replaced them with skinheads until it was like this skinhead war den uh, within the space of a month or two. So what was your first exposure to the world of skinheads and white power uh, i was music i i was uh sitting outside a punk show i i had friends who were like shaving their heads um there was a uh oh i i, I was the movie almost escaped me there's a movie called suburbia mm -hmm. they were kind of a cult film from the 80s about punk rockers and, and i haven't seen it in forever I'd, I'd love to watch it again now but in suburbia, it was basically about a bunch of punk rockers who drink and get in fights and <laughs> pretty much exactly what I was doing. But in that movie, there was a skinhead guy who had his head shaved and he wore a, a flight jacket and he had big boots on and he was really tough and he was like beating people up. And I, and I was like, yeah, that's, I like that. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to do that too. And so I started shaving, I shaved off my mohawk and I got a shaved head and I'm, it just kind of fit. It felt good, but it, it didn't have any like ideological underpinnings at the time. And the other thing that attracted me to the whole skinhead look was that it, at the time in New York city, there was kind of like a, a New York brand of, of punk called New York hardcore bands like the Crow Mags, Agnostic Front. And, and I, I love those bands. And, and they, those guys were all like, yeah, we're skinheads. And they weren't racist by any stretch, but they were kind of nationalist. They were kind of like, yeah, we're American skinheads. And that attracted me, because, again, because the Peace Punks hated it. The, the Peace Punks were very like, you know, they burned the American flag. And again, I didn't give a shit one way or another. Like I, I didn't have strong feelings about America, but if wearing an American flag is going to ruin the Peace Punks day, then that's what I'm going to do. 
And so that's who I was when uh, a friend of mine, a uh, uh, girl who was like OG punk rock scene queen, um, she was driving a tour bus for a punk band called Cheetah Chrome Motherfuckers. And she got the bus all the way to New York City. And when they were, by the time they got there, she said like these guys were like so filthy and their hygiene was so poor that she just like bailed on the whole tour. She's like, I can't be in this, I can't be in this band with you guys anymore. You're disgusting. And, and she just kind of started kicking it in New York City. And that's where she met some like New York skinheads who were, you know, they had like, you know, shined boots and clean clothes and Fred Perry shirts. And she kind of just like, oh, I like this like clean, sharp look. And, and she kind of got into that look herself. And on the way back from New York, she stopped in Chicago where she met a group called the Chicago Area Skinheads, which were, to my knowledge, like the first white power skinhead crew in the United States. And it's important to, to point out that the whole skinhead counterculture arose in the late 1960s in the UK, and they were typically all like football hooligans. They'd go to like soccer games and fight the opposing fans, but they, they listened to reggae. And they, among them, they counted like Pakistani immigrants and immigrants from the West Indies. So it wasn't a racial thing to begin with. But towards the late 70s, there's a fascist group in the UK called the National Front. And in the, the, the white skinheads, they saw the potential for like a kind of brown shirt. So they, and, and the other thing about skinheads is like skinheads were working class as opposed to like the flashy mods, like the Who or the Rolling Stones, who got all these fancy clothes and scooters and whatnot. Like the skinheads were poor and they're on the dole. And, and so the National Front would come in there and say, hey, you know, the, the reason why you're poor is because of this Pakistani immigrant. Like he's not your friend, he's a problem. And that's where the whole offshoot of white power skinheads began. And so to this day, I, I'm, I'm intentional about that because when people think skinhead Nazi, it's, it's really not historically accurate to that counterculture. Um, and of course we totally turned that around. It, 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 according to us back then, if you weren't a Nazi, you weren't a real skinhead. And this is what the Chicago area skinheads imparted on my friend Jane. And she came back up to Milwaukee with like a battered 50th generation tape of a, a British skinhead band called Screwdriver. And that was my first exposure to, to white nationalism was I, the, the record that she played for me was uh, called Hail the New Dawn. And it started out with this real like chugging guitar fading in and it's like -da 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 and then you're here I'm like hail, 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 hail. these like hails and chants are getting louder and louder and then the the lead singer Ian Stewart who died in a drunk driving accident in the early 2000s early 90s actually and they made it sound like he was a big martyr but um, the, the guy was really magnetic and, and the, the music was, it, it just made like the hair on the back of my neck stand up. And I'm like, oh, oh, I'm like, where has this been all my life? And, and the, the, again, the biggest attraction to me was that it was so repulsive to civil society. It wasn't like, hey, I'm white and I'm looking for other white people so I can hate everybody else. It's like, no, I'm just looking for the best way, the most effective way to piss off the most people the most at the, at the same time. And when somebody like says, hey, this swastika is a symbol of your people. And I'm like, yeah, it is. And it really, really pisses people off. And, and that was my attraction to it. That, that's what got me into it at the beginning. So when you would hear these references to hell and swastik, swastikas and things like this, Nazis, would you go and cross-reference and do your own research or were you just kind of believe whatever they were telling you and, and kind of get indoctrinated, allow yourself to become indoctrinated into this culture? Well, a, a lot of the, the attraction to it, and this is like exponentially truer today with social media and algorithms mm -hmm. creating these bubbles, but is basically like, I, I again, I, I grew up with Jewish friends. I went through a bunch of bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs when I was in sixth grade. Like, and I had a lot of fun too, <laughs> like, it's awesome. Um, 
I, I had a, an English teacher my freshman year of high school uh, who was a Jewish man and, and our entire year was like Holocaust studies. We read like Night by Eli Wiesel and Anne Frank's Diary. And, and again, I just like, I, I got defensive about it. I'm like, hey, I'm German, but like my ancestors were all here already when this shit happened. So like, why, why do I got to hear about this? Like, why am I being blamed for this? And then I, again, I, I noticed that it's something I can poke at and really upset this guy. And I, I like, I made my English teacher cry. I, I said horrible things to him. Like, oh, I wish they would have got you too. Like, oh, you know, I wish they would have got 6 million more. And, and again, it wasn't because I had any logical, not that there is a logical reason, but it wasn't like, a, oh, I, Jews are bad because of this. I'm like, no, this, this hurts him. This is a good way for me to bully him. It, it's a way I can have power over him. And so when I get into white nationalism and they say, yeah, actually the Holocaust didn't happen. Like Hitler was a great man who fought for our people and they don't want you to know that. They don't want us to talk about that. So now there's this like forbidden nature of it where you think that you're, you're partial to knowledge that is uh, only you know known by you and the select few. And, and again, it's a... Uh, um, I, ironically, nowadays of many ironic things, I'm a huge fan of uh, Yuval Noah Harari, the author of uh, Sapiens and all mm -hmm. sorts of other great books, who's a, a gay Israeli anthropologist. Um, and, and he said something that's real profound about it, conspiracy theories and super simple. He's like, people like conspiracy theories because they don't like to feel stupid. Mm -hmm. So when there's some really crazy, complex situation in the world, and you can't even begin to get your head around it. But then a conspiracy theory is presented to you with this really simple answer and a simple answer that makes you feel like you're smart. Like you know something that other people don't. It's incredibly attractive to you. And, and for me, it wasn't necessarily that I, I wanted to feel smart because everybody told me how smart I was my whole life, but it, there was definitely a, an attraction to it. And like, I know. I know the lies about the Holocaust. And, and to this day, if you have the misfortune of talking to any Holocaust denier, um, they're, they're, you'll see that coming across very plainly. So th that, that was really the dynamic of, of how it happened, was the, it was more like the emotional dynamics of it that were important to me. And of course, this is all like Monday morning psychoanalysis. At the time, I didn't know, you know, aware of what was happening. But looking back, I think that's what it was. It was it was way more about emotions and and my failure to healthily process the trauma I had experienced as a kid than it was about like the nuts and bolts of the ideology itself. Mm. And so the next several years were full of fights concussions, beating people up, alcohol, yeah. um, trying to kill yourself. I think you, your mom told you you were one sixteenth Native American. And, and what did I, you, how did you handle that? I did. That was the, that was Thanksgiving of 1989. So mm -hmm. at that point I got involved in, in white nationalism in 1987. And, in, and, uh, by Thanksgiving 89, I had, uh, the first of a string of skinhead girl girlfriends, and her and I show up to our family Thanksgiving, like good and drunk. And <clears throat> typically at our Thanksgivings, the only people who weren't good and drunk were my grandma, Jerry, and my mom. Um, everybody else is just rip roaring wasted, all the other adults. And so I, now I'm an adult and I, I was 18 at the time and I'm, I'm rip roaring drunk also. And as soon as I sit down at the table, I'm all like, oh, the white race and the Jews and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just going on about this. And At Thanksgiving. Uh, at Thanksgiving, <laughs> yep. Good. And, and my, my dad's kind of like, oh, come on, Arnie. You know, and he's just kind of poo-pooing it. And, and that you know, didn't phase me at all. But then my mom goes, uh, well, Mr. Nazi, did you know that you're one sixteenth Native American? Because your great grandpa Bordeaux was a French uh, Canadian or Cadian, and and he has you know Native people Indian blood, and so do you. And I was like, that's not true. You you that, that you know I, I freaked out. I I absolutely blew up uh, when stomping out of Thanksgiving, 
I went back to this hovel. This, this, we were like on our third skinhead hovel by this point after the 700 Club. And I, I locked myself in the bedroom that my girlfriend and I shared. I had a case of uh, returnable beer bottles. And I, the first thing I did was I wrote a letter to Tom Metzger who at the time was like the big honcho in, in the U.S. white nationalist scene. And I, I said, you know, I, I'm so ashamed. And, I, you know, my mom said I'm not the pure-blooded Aryan white man. And, I, you know, I, I think I'm just going to end it all because I don't think I have anything to live for if I, if I don't have my people. And, and I, I had really, like, gotten myself so wrapped up in this identity at this point that I, I believed that. And I... I drank until I, I got to the point where I, I broke one of the bottles and I just started carving up my wrist with it. And that was the last thing I remember. And apparently what happened was my girlfriend like kicked the door in and I, not to give advice about like how to slit your wrist properly, but a beer bottle is not the best way to do it. Fortunately, otherwise we wouldn't be here talking about it right now, but I was bleeding pretty good. And, and my girlfriend came in there and, fortunately for me skinhead girls aren't squeamish at the sight of blood and most of them do basic first aid that you put pressure on a bleeding wound and that's what my girlfriend did uh till the bleeding stopped and i woke up the next day with a really wicked hangover and this huge gash in my my wrist and that was the, the first time that i actually attempted suicide during that seven year span um, I, I also slipped my wrist again and came much closer to, to dying uh, in 1992, a week after my daughter was born. Mm -hmm. And and her mother was uh, uh, the last skinhead girl I had dated. And uh, it, it, that all happened because uh, a week after my daughter was born, my younger brother and I came home at bar time at 2 a.m. in Wisconsin. And I was like covered with someone else's blood. And... Cassandra, my, my baby mama said, uh, you know, you're a piece of shit. Like you're a father and you can't do this stuff now. And she, and she was I mean, understandably very upset and she just tore into me and I had nothing to say in my defense other than to take a, a big combat dagger that I had that was a big knife about this big that was sharp enough to shave with. And I just said, is this what you want then? And I went boom and I just about like took my left hand off and that, that was a, a lot closer to death. Uh, again, my girlfriend saved my life um, and called the EMTs. And I remember briefly coming too long enough to swing at the EMT with my right hand. And he's like, I'm trying to save your life, asshole. <laughs> and then the next thing I knew was I, I woke up in ICU uh, surrounded by my family and my girlfriend and and some of my closer friends in the crew too who are all just like really pissed at me and i i remember being in um the mental health unit as as is mandatory for suicide attempts and i was in there for three days and this is back when you could smoke in those places still and i was smoking and i just remember sitting there smoking being like these people are nuts. <laughs> like, I don't belong in here. <laughs> and, and my psychiatrist who treated me said like, yeah, I don't think you have any diagnosable mental health issues, but like, this is alcohol psychosis. And, and it, I'm going to, I remember them saying like, it, I, I regret that I can't order treatment for you, but I, all I can do is strongly suggest it. And so I, I did quit drinking for a month after that. Um, and a month later was my birthday and, and my very well-meaning girlfriend said, Oh, you can just have one beer. Like it'll be okay. And, and I started drinking again and drank profusely for another decade after that. Uh, but that, that was the second official suicide attempt. And, and I always say it, it could definitely be argued that that entire seven year span was an ongoing suicide attempt because mm -hmm. I, I had absolutely zero regard for my safety. There were times like, we'd be in the inner city of Milwaukee getting in these really racially charged confrontations with people and guns would be pulled on us. And we'd just be like, you better kill me. Take a shot. Like just really putting ourselves in, in harm's way at every opportunity with, with zero regard for our own safety. And, and to me, I think that that definitely qualifies as suicidal. 
So I have a couple of more questions before we get to your sort of transformation and your redemption moment. Um, I'm curious, what was a day in the life like as a white nationalist skinhead, um, you know, right before you, you became a father? And, and then, and then um, also, what sort of interactions were you having with BIPOC, you know, people of color um, during that time? Because I'm sure you had to have a job and I'm sure you were right. coming across people and you had the woman in McDonald's. So right. can you take us, give us just a, uh, an example of some of those experiences? <clears throat> well, the, the, the typical day for me would be, I, I always had a job and, and I always managed to I, I got my first full-time job when, after telling my mom I wasn't going to go back to school, my mom's a very practical person. And she's like, if you're not going to go back to school, you're going to get a job because we can't afford to support you. So she had a high school friend named Jack Cooper who had a t-shirt printing business. And uh, Jack said, sure, I'll give him a job. So at 16, I started printing t-shirts 40 hours a week, third shift. And, and I was really good at it. And I, and I liked doing it. It was kind of fun. And, and they're, the t-shirts we printed were all like unlicensed rock shirts. <laughs> so it was, it was cool printing shirts for bands I liked. And my mom actually did the artwork for a lot of the t-shirts, but it wasn't legal. And uh, the place got raided every once in a while by federal marshals. And after a couple of years, it got raided one too many times and it all shut down. But then I just went and got a job printing t-shirts somewhere else. Uh, so my day-to-day -day life was, was always work. Uh, I'd always be working 40 hours a week and I'd always like show up to work either still drunk or hungover and manage to still perform well enough to keep a job and to get there on time enough to not get fired. But, um, beyond that, I, I think the simplest way to describe day-to-day -day life is just being terrified of everything in the world like every person that you see is an enemy, no matter what their complexion is. Because if, if they're white and they're not in your crew, they are a traitor. They're a traitor to your people. They're, they're complicit in the destruction of the white race. And actually it's the highest order of enemy because we would say like, well, you know, Jews and blacks and Mexicans, like they, they're just being what they are. But like white people, white man should be fighting for his race. And when they're not, they're a traitor. So everyone's an enemy. Everyone who doesn't look like me is immediately an enemy. Anyone who could even be construed as looking Jewish or whatever is, is an enemy. And then anyone who's not, who's just like a normal, normal looking white guy, they're an enemy also for not being on my side. So it's just this exercise of, of, constantly surrounding yourself with enemies and, and it's basically like I, I use the analogy of a lens in that uh i i'm my eyesight is very poor and this would be on this computer screen i need big thick glasses and these lenses allow me they correct my uh myopia so that i can see things that are far away without them i can't see anything and i i really believe that all human beings create their own reality through the lens that they interact with the world through. And at that time, the lens that I had crafted myself told me that the color of my skin made me different than everyone else, superior to everyone else, and at the same time, threatened by everyone else and at war with everyone else. So this is all, and again, looking back, I wasn't aware that I'm the one who created this. It, looking back, I just like felt like I felt my I found myself in this reality where I have no choice but to fight for my people, otherwise we're going to be exterminated. Uh, but it, it it was all of my own doing, and so that that it took a ton of energy to to craft that lens in the first place, and then to keep it front and center, so that everything that I'm experiencing goes through the lens, and and nothing kind of sneaks by it. And it, inevitably, uh, it, typically at work, uh, I would have interactions with Afro-American people, with Latino coworkers, with Asian-American coworkers. My boss, Jack Cooper, was a Jewish guy. And all of them, just about to a person, and, and, and again, there's no mistaking who I am and what I'm about. 
like <laughs> this gnarly looking shaved head kid with swastikas tattooed on him and swastikas on his jackets that's no one's like hmm i wonder you know what's his deal like no it was pretty obvious what my deal was and if it wasn't obvious i would tell you i i, I was anybody who wants to talk to me we're going to talk about race like any oh how are the packers doing race well, they, you know, blah, blah, blah. black guys and white guys shouldn't be on the same team. That any any topic you bring up is going to be immediately drawn to race by me. And when how are I, you getting these jobs if you're walking around with all these swat stickers talking about <laughs> race? All the time? I'd, I'd go in with uh, without my ja my swastika jacket. That's for sure. First of all, my mom got me the first job, uh, and and the, the next job I got, I, I had my going to get a job deal. Where I, I, you know, just wear like a plain jacket. I kind of. It's a hell of a bait and switch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, You're absolutely. hired. You come absolutely. in with your spot stickers. Well, I, and I, I had experience printing T-shirts, and I wasn't very really good at it. So yeah. it, it was. Uh, um, I, I just think people like it, for these the subsequent jobs, people didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it. Hmm. Whereas nowadays, people pay a lot more attention to it than than uh, back then. But my my coworkers were. They to put it very simply, they'd never hate me back. Mm. Like I, I wanted them to hate me. And I'm always trying to like just cultivate that hatred. If, if I if I have an Afro-American coworker, I'll be like, how does it make you feel when you see a black woman with a white man? You don't like that, do you? And that bothers you. Don't and, and some of these guys be like, yeah, it kind of does bother me actually. <laughs> they're like, yeah, see, see. Like Louis Farrakhan, you know, I, 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 I want them to be separatists. I, I want them to be nationalists. And, and yet, even the guys who were kind of like, yeah, it bothers me a little bit, are, are, we're still like, you know, look, we're all human beings. You know, the, the, the color of our skin shouldn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. And I, that, would, oh, that was the worst thing you could say to me. I, oh, yes, it does. And, and I would go on a big diatribe as, as to, you know, racial, biological differences, as if there was a scientific basis to race, which there, there's not, and there never has been. Um, and, and that was my interaction with uh, people who didn't look like me. And, and I, I, looking back and, and, you know, not the segue to our <laughs> next, next discussion here, but it was really like, when when they refused to hate me back, they were putting themselves in a position of power. Mm. Because my objective back then was to just cultivate hostility. I wanted mm. hate from everyone. And if, I, if you were hating me, that's all the better. Like, please hate me. I want you to hate me. And when someone said, no, I'm not gonna hate you. Like, this is how a human being should treat another human being. That was defiance. That, that was power. And, and I liken it to, again, yeah, I'm a big sports fan. I love American football. I love hockey. I love MMA. And, and in any kind of sporting event, anytime you're watching, you're hearing a commentator or you're hearing a coach talking, they're always talking like, we want to play our game. We want to make them play our game. Like we're a running team. We're going to run the ball right down the middle. We're going to play our game. Well, if I was trying to play my game, my game was hate. And these people are like, no, you're, we're not playing your game. We're, we're playing my game, which is this is how a human being acts. This is how a human being treats another human being. And in doing so, they were dictating the terms of engagement to me rather than allowing me to do that. And, and that's how you prevail in the conflict. That's how you uh, accomplish an objective. And so the Black woman at McDonald's, who you took your paycheck to every week to go get your Big Mac feast, yeah. Was she an older woman or was she around your age? No, she was, she was elderly. Uh, I, I, she really reminded me of my grandma mm. I, I, on top of, and, and I'll, I'll say my, my grandma Marge um, on my dad's side, this is my, my father's mother who was, had the misfortune to be married to Arnold II, who was, he was a mean drunk and, and he was a, a big beast of a man. And I, I, I kind of, I get a lot from him, but like one of the things I get is my voice and like his voice makes my voice now sound like a prepubescent Swedish boy. Like mm -hmm. his voice was just, and he was constantly just horrible to my grandma. And my grandma was the, the closest thing to a living saint that I've ever met in my life. She was just the, the, the gentlest, kindest human being 
ever. And uh, a lot of times I feel like I, I failed her when, when I hate people and hurt people. And, and it's, it's, she's been gone since 2008 now, but um, she's always with me and, and my thoughts now. And, and when I, this, this interaction happened at McDonald's, uh, it was an elderly woman who was probably pretty close to my, my grandma's age uh, behind the counter taking orders. And from the second I walked in there, she just had this beautiful smile and uh, this kind of aura about her of, of love and, and of, of, of acceptance. And, and love is, is by nature unconditional. If it's conditional, it's not love. And, and that love she had just kind of radiated out to everybody who walked through the door of that McDonald's. And it made me very, very uncomfortable because I'm trying to hate black people. And here is this old lady, like just by her presence, defying everything that I, I'm trying to be. And, and just without saying a word, with just a smile, she's, she's like driving home how wrong I am of, of every, about everything, about the entire world. And ultimately in this interaction, I, I would go there every Wednesday when I got paid and I'd get a Big Mac and the rest of the time I ate nothing but ramen noodles, like the 10 for a dollar packs of ramen noodles so I could have more drinking money. So I'm a gifted genius. And uh, the one day a week I'd eat something else was a Big Mac at this McDonald's right by the check cashing place. And the first time I walked in and I saw her, I was kind of just struck and I just very awkwardly ordered my food and scurried out of there. The next time I came back, she recognized me. She, she remembered what I ordered. She's asking me about my day. And I, I, this is just like really upsetting me. And again, I, yeah, well, great, fine, sure, okay. And I get my food and I scurry out of there. And then in between that visit and the next one, at, on every night, at, this is back in the 700 Club days, every night at 700 Club was a big raging party. Like Monday was a big party, but Saturday was like that times 10. And this particular Saturday, somebody's over with a homemade tattoo machine and I was already covered with them. And I had the bright idea to get a swastika on this middle finger. And that was specifically so that for that cultivation of hatred, if somebody wasn't sure if they hated me or not, I'd just go, hey, fuck you. Well, what do you think now? It, it, like, I, not only am I flipping you off, but I'm flipping you off with a swastika as an exclamation point. And so I go back to McDonald's this next Wednesday and I froze in the doorway, seeing her there behind the counter. And I'm just like, I, I just had this involuntary feeling. I'm like, I don't want her to see this. Mm. I don't want her to see this swastika. I, I was ashamed of it. Like no reason behind it. It was just like this deep gut feeling. I was ashamed of myself. And I'm sitting there for a minute, like wondering if anybody else works at this McDonald's and <laughs> is anybody else going to come up to the next register? And like, nope, it's just her. And I'm, I'm thinking also like, where's the next closest McDonald's? And, and it was a good half mile away and it was December in Wisconsin. So it was pretty cold. And I'm just like, all right, I'm going to go, I'm going to keep my hand in my pocket so she doesn't see this tattoo. And I, it didn't occur to me that I have to reach into my pocket to get the money out and hand her the money. And as I was doing that, she saw the swastika and she said to me in the same way when I used to beat up my little brother and my grandma would kind of call me on it. She's just like, what is that on your finger? And I, I'm, I had, all I could do is stare down at my boots and, and I, I was a good foot taller than her at that point. And I felt like I was six inches high. And I, mm -hmm. all you do is just say, it's nothing. I didn't say that's a symbol of my people. You know, I didn't go into my old diatribes. I was I was literally powerless. And she just said, I, I know you're a better person than that. That's not who you are. And I'm just like, can I just have my big man, please? And I, I got my food and I I I I ran out of there. And and I I always say I would love to tell people that I went like skipping out going, racism stupid, like she's so nice, I'm cured. But I, I actually wolf the big mac home on the way home or big back down on the way home and i got home and i just started pounding beer and got as drunk as i could as fast as i could and then i went out in the streets and i just picked a fight with the first person i saw because i was trying to put as much distance between myself and this like experience of humanity that i had just had as i possibly could and and i i spent all sorts of energy trying to erase that from my psyche 
and just pretend like it never happens. But the, the human psyche doesn't work like that. Like once we, we experience something, it's part of us forever going forward. You can't just erase it. You can't pretend it never happened. It's, it's there, good, bad, or ugly. And so a, a lot of th this incident happened like in month three of my seven year involvement in white nationalism. And for that entire seven years, like that kept coming up over and over and over again. Anytime I'd even see an old black lady, I'd be like, oh, well, no, yeah. I'd, I'd think of her. And, and I, it, it would cause me great discomfort in, in the place I was trying to be. And I, I, I really believe that was a big factor in the exhaustion that, that ultimately brought me to the point where I left in 1994. So let's cut to around that time you're picking up your daughter from daycare and you have this, this profound realization. That, that was actually after, after I had left. Um, okay. I, I left in 1994 and one of the most frequently asked questions I get is like, did people come after me? Was it hard mm -hmm. to leave? It, it was, it, it was, it felt awesome to leave. I, I'm just like, I, I can root for the Packers openly now. I can listen to the Beastie Boys again. I can watch Seinfeld. I can watch Blade Runner. I like all these things were forbidden in white nationalism, and and just the 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 freedom to get back into the the film, sports, music, pop culture that I, I had like voluntarily sequestered myself from. That was amazing, and I and it felt great, and and all the, no one came after me for a number of reasons, but the main reason was, and I, I, I do a lot of like corporate stuff nowadays. And when you're, you're talking with a business organization, like what's our organizational culture going to be? Like if, if we can make our organizational culture one where people practice kindness every day, how transformational is that going to be to our business of selling widgets? Like it's going to be super transformational because it gives you the power to make salty customers into advocates for you when, when you're able to, to take care of all their frustration and kind of parlay it in, into something in a connection with kindness. Well, when you think about a white nationalist organization, the organizational culture is literally hate and violence. <laughs> so like what, what practical effect does that have on the organization? All well, the practical effect is we fought each other as much as we fought anyone else. There, there was constant infighting. There was, it was very much like, there were organizations that had like formal hierarchies and the people are, I'm the commander and you know, they give themselves little titles and stuff. And we always thought that was kind of lame and we just did things kind of organically. And we were very much like a, a wolf pack where there, there were the alphas there were the kind of the nameless people in the middle and then there were the people on the bottom. And, and I always was like fighting to maintain my alpha status. Um, you're, I'm always fighting to maintain how white I am. That was like a typical infighting tactic was to question someone's pure blooded white Aryan Nordicness um, or accuse them of being gay, accuse them of being a Jew, like what have you. So all this stuff is going on and while the group membership locally had peaked about 150 people in like 1991 by 94 it had just cannibalized itself into just it was like me and the guys in my band and a couple of other the older guys and all of us had young families all of us worked like menial minimum wage jobs we're just like struggling to face the realities of adult life and and really getting burnt out so that's kind of where I, I was when I left. And the, the impetus for leaving was I became a single parent when my girlfriend and I broke up earlier in 94. And then a couple months later after a concert my band had played, a second friend of mine was murdered in a street fight. And by that point I had lost count how many friends had been incarcerated. So it really hit me that I had to leave for my daughter's sake. And so when I left, it was just like, it was an awesome thing. It was like hedonism. And, and I, I started going to rave parties about a year later, like the, the polar opposite of where I was going from like extreme hate and violence to extreme peace and love counterculture. And, and I was really just enjoying the ride, but it, it was maybe six months or so into the, the rave era of my life when I was attending a local community college 
and I had my daughter in daycare there and uh, she was about four years old at that time. <clears throat> and uh, the, the community college had a really awesome daycare room. Like there's big windows surrounding it and inside they had like this huge fort thing and like a little stream that went through the whole thing, like sand tables and they make sand castles. And it was, I always wanted to go in there and play myself. And, and so I, I'm going to pick up my daughter one time and I, I kind of pause outside the window, just watching her play with all the other kids. And this is a really diverse group of kids, of course. And they're all just playing. They're all just having fun. And I it just like, I'm just thinking like nobody gives a shit about the color of their skin. Like all they care about is, are you nice to them? Are you sharing with them? Are you fun to play with? Like it, it's, it's really kind of, distilled to this essence of, of, of human interaction. And I'm kind of contemplating that. And as I'm doing so, an Afro-American guy about my age shows up and he's picking up his daughter who's about my age. And when he comes walking in the room, I'm still outside watching from the windows at this point. When he comes walking in the room, his daughter, just like my daughter does, comes running up and like, daddy, and she jumps up into his arms and he picks her up and he's hugging her and she's all excited and, and I'm like looking at his face and I'm just thinking like, how could I ever think that this guy like loves his daughter any less than, than I love my daughter or that she loves him any less than my daughter loves me be, because of the amount of melanin we do or don't have in our skin. And, and then I thought about all the people that I hurt. Uh, the, a lot of people I hurt were, were because of their complexion, because, because of melanin in their skin. And I would, I, there were times when I jumped on people and I, I beat them so badly that I, their, only their parents could recognize them. And I thought of all that that had happened. And, and then I, I asked myself, like, how, how wrong were you? Like, could you have been any more wrong than you were? And, and that was, I, I think that was really like a, a big step along my journey to the point where I, I eventually, it, it took a long time, but I eventually got, had this growing feeling that like, I need to do something positive in the world. I need to do something that, to help people heal and to, to somehow bring about a world where there's less hatred and less violence. And, and not only do I need to do that, like that's the least I can do considering all the harm that I've done. So, yeah, and then cut to 10 years later, you're, you're campaigning for Barack Obama. <laughs> <laughs> I was. 2008 I, I was I'll never forget that it, it was uh it was the most politically involved I've been uh, before or since uh I, I I do look back at that time with like a little bit of regret um I I was so and, and I'm still a big fan of Barack Obama I I think he was one of our greatest presidents he did an amazing job in, in a very difficult time um but I, when, when I was campaigning for him, I was very much like, if, if we get Barack elected, like everything is going to be fixed. Like everything's, this will all be over. Like we'll have this wonderful place to live and like everybody will be valued and included. It will be so beautiful. And, and yeah, no. <laughs> and, and through no, no fault of his. I, I really think he, and, and he made mistakes. And he's, he's not perfect. Nobody's perfect, but um, it just the kind of the, the cold, the harsh reality of human politics, like really sunk in during uh, Obama's, both of his administrations. And, and I, I and, and so by 2012, I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll put in a little money and I'll vote for him. But <laughs> like that's, all, I, that's all the energy I got for it now. I, I'm, I'm not going to be knocking on doors and and, I, and I've really like kind of gotten farther and farther removed from politics since then. Um, and, and honestly, I think politics have, have gotten uglier and uglier since then, so, somehow. But uh, yeah, that's the sad fact. Did you find that a lot of your um, peers who were having these you know, young families, were they all sort of transitioning out as well? And if so, um, what was your 
what were the breadcrumbs of you starting to convert people out of out of white nationalism and into I don't know what you would call it at that time, but yeah, how did that how did that all start? Well, it, it, when I was leaving, and I I kind of made it known just to a select few people, and and it, it's interesting to look back that as messed up as we were as human beings back then there were still like genuine friendship and connection mm. at times like underneath all the the nonsense going on and uh and, and then you had on top of that like we were in messed up situations like i've i've saved guys lives and i've had guys save my lives and life in a, in a street fight and and it's just kind of that closeness that combat brings between people it, it really kind of happened between me and, and a number of my friends from back then and so it was with those friends that i actually took the time to sit down and be like look dude i can't do this anymore i'm leaving and it there was a, a, a range of responses from them um the typical response would be like well but, but what about the white race and yada 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 i'm like dude i've said all that stuff a million times like i told you that stuff five years ago like i i it's it's bullshit it's not it's not real that's not how the world is and they were kind of like, well a little dejected <laughs> that didn't like make too much of an effort um and, and i really got the feeling as i was talking to these guys a lot of them were it, almost to a person were kind of like uh, as they're watching me go they're kind of like yeah and, and i i just had a gut feeling that they would be along shortly thereafter and for the most part uh you know if i if i well, when i wrote my life after hate i actually because i was such a drunk during that seven year span um i really needed to like clear up a lot of things i had a lot of memories that were so hazy that i needed to be like hey what the hell happened that night or you know what happened then and so i sat down and i did about like 50 hours of interviewing with all my friends who had also got out with me and it, by that time that I, I started writing the book in like 2007 that just about everyone I knew from back then had left white nationalism formally and like got on with their life in one way or another um some of them like completely 180'd and became very progressive and like also voted for Obama and and some of them to this day think like Donald Trump's a great guy and and when I think about that, I'm like, well, you know, you haven't come very far, but uh, it, it's the bottom line is that, that even those guys, uh, one of them comes to mind who's uh, started a business and, and became pretty successful. And, and him and I were just talking one day and he's like, you know, I, he's like, I, I don't agree with your politics, but he's like, just, I, I hope you understand that like the, the bulk of my employees are Latino. And I, I pay them, I not only pay them fairly, but like a lot of them have, have generated wealth of their own for their family because of the business that we all run together. And, and just like from a, that kind of right-wing business standpoint, like it seemed logic my dad has, uh, you know, and I, I thought about that and I'm like, you know, that's, that's, that is something, you know, I can't just like poo poo that. Um, I, there, one of the guys, I, I was actually doing some work for him <laughs> doing what I'm doing now is not always the most lucrative thing. So there are times I'm like, okay, I'll go paint a house or whatever, <laughs> keep the bills paid. And, and, uh, I was painting for one of these guys and he had like a contract in business and, um, he made a point out of hiring young African-American men who like needed a chance like guys who mm -hmm. just got out of prison and this is someone who's really conservative mm -hmm. and then you know would was not be down with barack obama whatsoever but he's he is he does like see this young man who like needs a job and and he wants to he gives him a, a decent paying job and an opportunity to to you know make something out of himself and an opportunity to advance and so i i it really kind of challenged me to look outside of that political lens and just start looking at that human lens and really get to the point where it's like i don't i you know I'm, I'm more concerned with how you treat people than what hashtags you use or don't use and, and who you vote for and not to discount the 
the effects of who's in office. Like, obviously, that's a huge effect on everybody's life. But um, I, I think we get way too wrapped up in that and, and we lose sight of the, the, the basic goodness in our fellow human beings when we, we see everything through a political lens. So when you wrote My Life After Hate, had you been doing the speaking and the converting and, the, and, and meeting with people, um, working very actively behind the scenes, or was that kind of your first foray into this other side of things? I, I started writing first. Um, mm -hmm. Really, the way the whole thing evolved was I, I quit drinking in 2004. Okay. And that was that was a big deal on all kinds of levels. But <laughs> um, as far as like my career path and my activism path goes, I, I, I spent seven years in the rave scene. And I was just as into that as I was ever in anything else. And I love it every minute of it, like having the best time, making great friends. I still love techno. Uh, a couple of months ago, I was at an all night techno party in Brooklyn and love it. <laughs> I could barely walk afterwards, but I, mean, I, I, I love that scene. I love the music. Um, but it, it was, I, I was still numbing myself. Mm -hmm. like numbing myself with this like immersed in, in the, this this amazing hyper real counterculture uh numbing myself with alcohol numbing myself with all sorts of drugs psychedelics whatnot um so when i quit drinking all of a sudden the, the substance to numb myself isn't there and and again it like kind of like when i left the movement as we called it I, I felt great. I'm like, this is amazing. Like when I quit drinking, I'm like, this is amazing. Wow. Like not being hungover. This is awesome. And I'm really just like loving, not having my senses fuzzy 24 seven. But, um, I, I started a business then I was already doing it consulting and I, I talked to a foolish friend of mine in the backing uh, consultancy financially and, and trying to get that off the ground. And then I also, uh, met this woman who I just fell absolutely madly head over heels in love with the first second I saw her and we hung out platonically for like a couple months and and that really made it all the the deeper when we started getting romantic and um, to make a very long story short six months later she dumps me and I, I had this like just the worst heartbreak I'd ever experienced in my life and, and again there's nothing to numb it now like there's, I, there's no alcohol to hide behind. And, and I, 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 this girl's deal was like, she was in her thirties, biological clock ticking, wants to have more kids. She's from a poor background. She wants the nice stuff in, in our nice suburb. She wants a Range Rover or a McMansion, the, the driveway to park it in. And, and I'm like, oh, I live with my mom. And <laughs> I'm like, five high five figures in debt <laughs> that just like didn't work for her and, and I, I just really got down on myself and I'm just like you know I, I'm, I'm worthless like I didn't have my shit together when the woman of my dreams came along and it's really started like beating myself up for all of my what I saw as failures and, and, and as, as it got worse and worse and when I say it got worse and worse I mean I just I got into this like suicidal depression Mm -hmm. where I, again i was just constantly thinking about killing myself the only reason i didn't was because of my daughter i had i been single had i not had a child at that point i would have killed myself like mm -hmm. and and done it right this time having mm -hmm. made two failed attempts before i it was so bad that i resented my daughter that she was in the way of my suicide and and as i was in these, this like depths of depression and and really like the far and away the most difficult part of my life because the my whole time in the movement i was rip roaring drunk the whole time like it's I, I don't really remember what that feels like i have to really like dig deep to to think about how it felt but like this is raw and real and and ridiculous pain and i i it, it hit me then that it really wasn't about this woman who broke my heart it wasn't about the heartbreak it was about all this harm that i had done to innocent people and harm that I had done to the world and harm that I had done to broken white kids who came to me looking for help and something to believe in. And I just got them, you know, 
lit their fuse and set them off in society to hurt people. And, and the band that I had, had fronted had sold all these records and that no matter what I did, that harm was still out there and it was still reverberating and it was still hurting people. And, and I, I came to hate myself worse than I've ever hated anyone else in my life. Mm-hmm. And I, I just, I, I, I hated myself for a year straight, like a bitter, deep hatred. And it was finally my daughter who like grabbed me by the collar. <laughs> she, she was like 13 at this point. And she's just, my daughter and I are very raw and real with each other. And she's just like, dad, like fucking snap out of it. Like I need a dad. She was a bitch anyway. <laughs> I, I didn't like her. And I'm just like, holy shit. Okay. So like once again, my daughter is like the big impetus to snap me out of a really bad place. And I, that's when I started writing mm. and, and it, it kind of, I've always been like in D and D Dungeons and Dragons, like fantasy stuff. And, and I'm like, I have to slay the dragon of my past <laughs> before I'm going to win the hand of the beautiful princess and ride off into the sunset. And, and so it, it really, it, it was 2007 or so late in 2007 when really the idea of reconciling my past came front and center. Mm-hmm. And I, and I started to do that through writing that, that ultimately became my life after hate and a, a speaking career and, and an activism career. I, I went public with my story on the MLK holiday of 2010, um, inspired by MLK's speech at time to break the silence which was really more about the Vietnam War and <laughs> how our economy works than, than like, but the speech title was really resonated with me. And I'm like, you know, it is, it's time for me to break the silence about, about my, and, and I, I would also add that I, I wasn't like, in this interim time between 94 and 2010, I wasn't like hiding it. And, mm-hmm. and there was like, back in the early rave days, I still had swastikas all over me. And, you know, I'd be like, whooping it up with my raver friends and then one of them would be like what the hell's up with that and i'm like yeah you know i used to be a racist skinhead and i feel horrible about it and they're like well you're not anymore are you and i'm like no they're like okay dush, dush, dush. <laughs> <laughs> like, everybody was like that everybody was like super forgiving super uh accepting of me when i when i needed it most and and that mm-hmm. was a huge reason that i was able to get to the point where I am now. And um, like a big factor in, in the direction that I took. So talk about that a little bit as we wind things down. The, the, you, you've mentioned that the main weapon that you use now when you're getting people out of hate groups and doing counter violence extremist uh, work, you say that, that forgiveness is the weapon. What, is that, what does that actually mean as it relates to maybe even the forgiveness project? Yeah, the Forgiveness Project is, is an amazing thing that I, I really love to evangelize. Um, people can find it at theforgivenessproject.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a, a brilliant journalist in London named Marina Cantacazino, who um, I believe it was around the time of the first Iraq war. She just had the idea to kind of start collecting stories of forgiveness. And she approached me to become a, a part of the Forgiveness Project in 2011. Uh, about a year or so after I started telling my story and I was really intimidated by it because I, I saw the the kind of the existing members of the forgiveness project and there were people who would like like Jill Hicks this woman who lost both of her legs at the at the knees in in the London 772 bombing who now like talks about forgiveness as the answer to violent extremism and and there were people like uh, Robbie Damelin, uh, an Israeli woman whose son David was killed by a Palestinian sniper. And when the IDF came to her door to tell her that David was dead, she said, you may not kill anyone in my son's name. Mm. And, and I, I, it just, it intimidated me to the core because I'm like, I, I, if anybody looks sideways at my daughter, I want to tear their head off. Like still this, I'm like, Mr. You know, kind Buddhist, blah, blah, blah. But like, you look sideways at my daughter. <laughs> it's, it's, I can't imagine it like even life continuing if someone hurt her, much less like forgiving people. And so I didn't feel worthy to be among 
people like Robbie and Jill. And I, I also didn't, I told Marina, I'm like, I don't even want to forgive. Nobody did anything to me. Like I, I'm the one who did all these horrible things. And, and Marina had heard my story. I was talking about the woman at McDonald's and Marina said, first of all, she's like, well, didn't that woman at McDonald's have to forgive you for, for her to treat you like that? And I'm like, well, yeah, yeah. And she's like, so forgiveness is part of your turnaround. Had people not forgiven you, do you think you would have been able to, to leave that life behind? And I'm like, well, no, yeah, you're right. And then she, the, the kicker was, and she said, well, what about self-forgiveness? And I was like, oh, yeah. Like <laughs> that, that I got a lot to say about. That's like what that whole suicidal depression year I spent post heartbreak was all that, that was I, not a million years would I forgive myself. Um, and interestingly, to, to parlay into to Buddhism and meditation, like in 2009, when I first learned to meditate, I, I had I was trying to find peace with never forgiving myself. I, I to me it, it seemed like I had to do something to honor the people that I hurt and I was like okay to honor them I'm never going to forgive myself for the harm that I've done and I I'm like I'll just have to find peace with that and and you can't find peace with that there's there is no peace when when you have a grudge against yourself and it was when I, I sat down to meditate and I'm being told to focus on my breath that I'm focusing on my breath for a split second. And for that split second, my mind is present where I am and I'm not regretting the past or worrying about the future. And then I'm hungry and all of a sudden I'm, oh, I want a double cheeseburger with the works from cops after this. And, oh, wait, that's not what I'm here to do. I'm going to let that thought go and I'm going to return my focus to my breath. And then another, oh, that asshole cut me off on the way here. Fuck that guy. Okay, nope, that's not what I'm here to do either. Like, let's just go back to our breath and keep returning to the breath. When I, 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 I like leaped off that cushion when the gong rang and, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm like, hey, if I can work with this thought of the double cheeseburger with the works from cops and, and the guy who cut me off, if I can work with those things, I can work with this grudge against myself because they're all the same raw material. Now, granted, the grudge is, is this mountain that's got decades and decades of, of hurt that I've in, endured and hurt that I've put out on people, but it's still the same stuff. So if I can work with one, I can work with the other. And that's when the possibility of self-forgiveness was introduced to my life through meditation. And since then, what I have found peace with is that self-forgiveness will be a lifetime journey for me. Mm. It, it's something that I'm, I'm always going to be working with. It's something that's always going to be a part of my process. And that's, that's not only okay, that's amazing. Because, because I'm on this journey of self-forgiveness, when I am reaching out to someone who is actively in a hate group, and I'm trying to, to let them know that there's a better way to live their life. And I, I'm here to walk with them to get there. I can talk about self-forgiveness with them because I'm a practitioner of it rather than like, oh, you know, I'm on some top of a mountain and I'm all enlightened and I'm just like doling out all this wisdom. It's like, no, dude, I'm not, I'm not preaching at you. I'm, I'm walking with you because I'm doing this myself. Like you're just leaving now. I lived 30 years ago and I'm still we're walking on this journey and you know what I'm, I'm delighted about it now i'm like i'm, I'm joyful I'm, I'm grateful and you can be there also if you just take that first step with me so that that process of being a, a, a practitioner is is what makes me effective in doing work to counter the harm that i've done and so that, that's, when I talk about forgiveness as a weapon, that's, that's how it manifests itself most obviously in my work today. Um, I, I would also, anytime I talk about forgiveness, I think about my dear friend, Pardeep Singh Kalika. Pardeep's father, Satwant, was murdered by a guy from the skinhead gang that I helped to start in the late 1980s. And Satwant was the last person murdered in the attack of, of seven people because he was fighting off the gunman with a butter knife. 
because the, the Gurdwara, that the, the Sikh temple that morning was full of elderly people and children who were hiding in the basement. And Sithwan, who was 61, was like, he was going to fight till his last breath. And he did. Uh, he, he was shot five times. And when the gunman was finally stopped by, by law enforcement, the gunman had butter knife wounds all over him from Sutwan, like fighting tooth and nail to save his, his community. And party reached out to me a couple months after the attack. It really just wanting to understand how could someone, how could someone do something so horrible? And the answer to that is, is practice. Practice can get you there. Practice is the answer to how someone can do something so horrible. And practice is the answer as to what we can do about it as a society. When you practice something, you, you become it. And when you practice hate and violence every day for every waking moment of your life, you, you realize a reality that is so miserable that nothing but homicide followed by suicide seems to make sense to you. And that's what I believe happened to Wade Page, who's the man who killed Party's father. And, and as far as the, the answer to it, if we practice kindness, if we practice forgiveness, we practice compassion, we make those things, things that we embody in our day-to-day -day life, we don't know who the next suffering damaged person is out there who's on the verge of harming a bunch of people and harming themselves. So the more kindness we put into the world, the greater the odds that we're going to have like the woman at McDonald's moment where, where this, that, that little seed of doubt is injected into that person's soul and, and it, that little spark of light to guide them out of a, a very miserable place is, is introduced into their world. Um, the, the odds of that happening are exponentially greater with every person who practices kindness. And when I, I, I think of forgiveness, I think of party because party said that to him, forgiveness is vengeance. Forgiveness is his vengeance against the man who murdered his dad and murdered six other people because they wore turbans, because they had dark skin, because they had beards, because they didn't look like him. And Pardeep and I do a lot of talks and, and we, we've known each other going on 10 years now and we're absolutely brothers in every sense of the word. And I've learned so much from him. And, and in the, the first talk where Pardeep said, forgiveness is vengeance during a Q and A, someone in the audience like looks up forgiveness or no, they look up vengeance um, on their phone, like the dictionary definition of vengeance, and they mm -hmm. read it. And they're like, can you still say the forgiveness is vengeance? And I'm, I, I answered, I'm like, dude, the guy who killed Pardeep's dad wanted to live in Pardeep's head and his heart for the rest of his life. He wanted to, to hijack Pardeep's time and energy from that point forward constantly looking back at that this atrocity and constantly being consumed with anger and hatred towards him like i the guy's dead but i can tell you with all the faith that i have that that was his motivation because i was in that place and that's how yeah. i acted and and party just by saying i forgive you is taking back all of that power he's taking back all of that time and energy I, we, party gets asked all the time people will say like, well, how come it's always the, the brown people who got to forgive? How come it's always the black people who got to forgive? And I, I can understand how it could seem like that. Absolutely. But I, the, the truth is, if you look at the Forgiveness Project, there are people of every background forgiving every way from this complexion to that complexion. And, and there really isn't a racial component to it. But party would say like, to me, it's an honor. To, to be in that position, to, to make that kind of statement for my community, for Sikhs, for Punjabis, for South Asian people. Um, it, it, it's for him, he's the type of guy who does believe in destiny. <laughs> it's like, this is my destiny, is that I, I need to lovingly challenge people out of their, their insular reaction to hate and to say like, you know, don't let hate win. Party has, a beautiful wife, his mom's still around, 
his widowed mother. He has four amazing kids. He is a mental health professional. He works for Parents for Peace, uh, intervening in, in violent extremism as a, as a licensed therapist. And if he's expending energy, energy hating the guy who killed his dad, it's energy that all of that doesn't get. It's energy that's not available for those people. I, I'm a former information technology consultant. You know, when like a computer gets a virus, the computer has a central processing unit, it's the chip, the, the brain of the computer that does all the work on your computer screen. What a virus will do is it'll suck all the power of that CPU. So it's using all your CPU power and you don't have anything left to do Zoom conference or a web page or word processing or whatever. That, that's what, what hatred does, is it sucks up all of, all of the energy you have in your life to do amazing things. It sucks up all the energy you have to love. And to me, I can't think of anything more vengeful than saying, you don't get that. Not hmm. going to do it. This is my energy. And I, I choose where it's directed. I choose to direct it towards love. And you can't stop me from doing that. Nothing you can do can stop me from doing that. That's defiance. That's vengeance. And so I, I, to me, like forgiveness is such a powerful thing. And it's so underrated in that, uh, in that sense but at the same time it, it, and this is kind of forgiveness project 101 just about every single member of the forgiveness project and there's hundreds of stories of forgiveness party has his own story in there um i believe didine or Uwanyana, our mutual friend i i've introduced her to marina and i'm not sure if she's like officially part of it now but all these wildly differing stories of forgiveness and, and differing opinions on it also. Like not everybody thinks the same way about forgiveness, but the one thing that pretty much everyone agrees upon is that forgiveness cannot be prescribed. Hmm. You can never look at someone who's been traumatized and be like, you should forgive them. That's what you need to do. Like that, that's, that's out of line. And it's out of line because it doesn't work that way. For forgiveness needs to be like a journey that's willingly taken. And I, and what, what, while I've never say to someone, you need to forgive, I can say, I can talk, tell stories of forgiveness from my perspective and everything I've learned about it and just kind of leave that out there for people to, to contemplate. And if after doing so they think, well, maybe I, I will forgive this person. And I, it actually reminds me, um, I was in London once and uh, the Forgiveness Project has a really amazing exhibit that travels around and it's got some great photography and the stories there. And it was at the, the OXO gallery on the Thames and, and I was like on the way there to do a little event. And I, I was walking in and this guy comes up to me and he's like, oh my God, you're him. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, come on, man. Don't do that. He's like, no, Arnold. Like I read your story. Like it really like resounded with me, and and, and tears start coming up. And he's like, because I read your story, I was able to forgive someone who hurt me, and and ever since I have, like my life has gotten so much better. And he's like, I just want you to know how, how much that means to me, and I'm just like, <laughs> like that's awesome, dude. I mean, I'm glad I could help with that, but like, you know, I'm one of a billion stories here. I'm, I'm glad mine resonated with you. But um, like, I'm like, go tell your own forgiveness story now. Go, you know, go, you know, practice this and go like put out in the world and, and uh, like, you know better than anyone how powerful it can be to hear a story of forgiveness. So like, go, go for it, man. Here's Marina. <laughs> Talk to, tell her your story. Like, let's, let's all get it out there. And, and that's, that's the power that it has. It, it can be just magnificently transformational for a, a human life. Well, I mean, you brought up destiny again, and that's, you know, the reason I like to contemplate that question with, with certain people who've had these life experiences that, you know, I don't think anybody would necessarily sign up for, right? But right. if I, if we pan back and I'm, I'm divine intelligence and I'm thinking, okay, let's see, how can I, there's a lot of hate happening on this, you know, plane of existence. Right. We need someone to be an example of what it's like to transform. Oh, there's this soul here. You know, we can put him in this family with this father and this bloodline. They live a very long time. We'll give him these really sketchy experiences in his early years, but then, <laughs> but then he'll 
you'll know, transform. Oh, we'll give him a daughter. Let's bring Ingun <laughs> into the picture, right. you know. And then, and then this black lady, this elderly black lady, clearly she doesn't want to have to work at McDonald's, right, you know, right. in her in her senior year. So maybe right. her whole family. There's all this drama happening in her background, like, you know, Mama's got to work at McDonald's. I can't believe this. You know, we should have done better. But right. because she was there and you were there, and I mean, it, when you really look, when you look back, as Steve Jobs says, in hindsight, look at the dots and how they right. all connect. It's yeah, kind of uh, kind of hard to deny that there wasn't some sort of divine something happening there because you're, you're just getting started, man. You know, you're, you've been out of that game for 30 years and now you've been, you've been focused on this, this other, you know, getting people out of the hate groups and, and helping all of us to understand that, that hate is really like a cancer, you know, it's, 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 and so it's not the people that are stricken with hate that we should be upset with or, you know, see as the enemy, we should see hate itself as the enemy. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. um, and that's, this is, this is very powerful work you've been doing so prolifically over these last uh, couple of decades. So anyway, I just want to acknowledge you for showing up in the way that you've been showing up and, and, and the fact that you don't have a perfect past and maybe you haven't forgiven yourself could be the internal motivation for continuing to do the work you're doing with such determination and, and persistence and, and willingness. And so maybe that's also by design as well. So yeah, thanks for, for, for doing everything you're doing right now.